the choice of surgery is going to be in part contingent upon local resource availability. The robotic platform may not be available uh, every time it's desired in a given situation, and, and therefore laparoscopy is much more readily available throughout the world. Uh, but there are parts of the world even laparoscopy isn't available, and, and then it ends up being a, a laparotomy. Fortunately, in terms of the oncologic outcomes, we see that they're very similar amongst open laparoscopic surgery and robotic surgery. An adjunct to laparoscopic surgery is the transanal total mesorectal excision, which allows, in my opinion, and from much of the data, a better operation from the transanal aspect deep in the pelvis than could be done laparoscopically, particularly in an obese male. So I think the choice comes down to what's available and, of course, what technology uh, the surgeon is most familiar with using because if somebody is only used to laparoscopy and they're told you've got to use a robot, that could be a problem. So it depends upon the learning, what, what education the surgeon has had. So it's, it's largely resource dependent, both training and availability. What we know is that, as I mentioned in response to the first question, the oncologic outcome is very similar. However, when we look at the disability and the hospitalization and the morbidity, those um, results are all much in favor of minimally invasive surgery. And the minimally invasive surgery, again, could be laparoscopic or robotic. What we do know is that once we start making big incisions and putting our hands in the abdomen, um, the patients are not going to do as well as we, when we can work through punctures, through ports, uh, through the anus or through tiny incision just for specimen extraction. So um, we've also seen globally an increase in the use of minimally invasive techniques, particularly for colon, less so for rectal because of the technical demand and because of the fact that rectal cancers are less common than our colon cancers and rectal cancers may tend to be treated more at high volume centers than throughout the community, whereas colon cancers are treated throughout the community. So we are seeing a significant, steady, and gratifying uptick in the use of minimally invasive techniques for colon cancer surgery. Artificial intelligence is very appealing. It's certainly a hot topic, but it doesn't yet have any widespread applicability in, in what we do. We can have fusion of images of MRI, CT, PET scan. Uh, we can have three-dimensional views, even laparoscopic. Certainly, we have them robotic. Uh, so, so all of these things are possible. Um, I think what we're more looking at now is image enhancement. So things like uh, endocyanine green, which in the United States is not FDA approved for uh, lymph node uh, identification in colorectal cancer. It is being used elsewhere in the world and it offers seemingly significant opportunities, not so much for rectal, but for transverse colon lesions, maybe right colon to know the lymph nodes which need to be resected if there's any anatomic aberrations. It may play a role in colon two for uh, high ligation, uh, sorry, in rectal two for high ligation, but that's less clear. So certainly image enhancement, image enhancement for, again, for uh, endocyanine green ureteric identification, um, ideally without the need for ureteric catheters at some point. Right now, people seem to be doing it by injecting endocyanine green through the ureteric catheters to allow uh, fluorescence of the ureters while working. Um, People have experimented with trying to see the pelvic nerves better, the splanchnic nerves to preserve uh, bladder and, and, and sexual function after surgery. So these are all image enhancements, uh, more so than the use of artificial intelligence at present. I think overall artificial intelligence is going to lead the way. It, it's been shown with certain artificial intelligence platforms that uh, conditions in the chest can be accurately diagnosed by imaging and then artificial intelligence platforms knowing whether or not something is problematic or needs to be pursued. There are certainly a lot of artificial intelligence platforms out there helping people with diabetes, with blood sugar control, 
Um, I believe that it's implanted in the technology of every pulse generator, such as a pacemaker. So there are areas that are way ahead of us. Um, for surgery, uh, there are certain areas which would be very beneficial, being able to somehow accurately distinguish for rectal lesions between a T1 and a T2, and again, between a T2 and a T3 lesion, because those, that knowledge might help direct what we're going to do in terms of local excision versus radical resection, neoadjuvant therapy versus straight to surgery. So somehow an artificial intelligence platform there. Similarly, some platform for follow-up. I mean, in whom do we need to offer intensive follow-up after surgery? Who does the follow-up have to be not so intensive? Uh, knowing which chemotherapeutic agent, who's going to respond to chemotherapy, Moreover, who's going to have an adverse response to chemotherapy? That's a very important thing to know. So there are a lot of opportunities uh, in the future. We're not there yet. Um, we need enough high fidelity, reliable data points with very high levels of sensitivity and specificity to give those data to the artificial intelligence platform to be able to then make, help us make the decision. Yeah, I, a few years ago, along with our head of pathology and laboratory medicine, Dr. Mariana Vero, uh, we published on precision medicine with one of my alumni, uh, Dr. John Efron, and, and one of his uh, trainees uh, at uh, Johns Hopkins. And we put something together, which we published, I think it was in Journal of the American College of Surgeons, about precision medicine. And at that point, it had to do with trying to predict, as I alluded to earlier a little bit, who's going to respond better to chemotherapy. And in particular, we were looking at stage two patients, because some stage two patients act more like stage three, and others act more like they should at stage two. And so which of those stage two patients would benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy was the topic of that paper. But that's a form of precision medicine. And it's a little bit like what I spoke about earlier with artificial intelligence. It's having enough data points that you can reliably predict high fidelity model because it's very high stakes. Who is going to benefit from chemotherapy? Who in whom can you um, do just a transanal excision instead of a radical resection? in whom do you really need to get all of these tests frequently in follow-up, uh, carcinoembryonic antigen, CAT scan, chest, abdomen, pelvis, colonoscopy, who, in whom do you really need to do that versus who has such low probability of uh, recurrence that you don't need to put them through all of uh, those tests and expend all the resources. And that, that's also precision medicine. I think it's very difficult for any journal to get started. There are so many journals in, in the world. Um, you know, I'm editor, one of the two editors in chief for surgery uh, journal. I'm, I'm, I'm an editor for colorectal disease and for techniques in colorectology. And I'm on the editorial board of many others, including Journal of the American College of Surgeons and Annals of Surgery and, and the like. Um, so there's a lot of journals. It's tough to establish a foothold. I, I think you're to do so, you need to distinguish yourself and do something different. And perhaps what you're doing different is focusing on minimally invasive surgery. And I think that's, that's a novel one. There is the Journal of Surgical Endoscopy, but that also includes some other things. Uh, it's called Surgical Endoscopy and Interventional Techniques. I'm on that editorial board as well. And that includes other techniques. So if you really focus on minimally invasive techniques, you'll find a niche, but it takes years of persistence and a lot of good friends to make sure that articles are submitted. Um, and if memory serves correct, the reason I uh, accepted your offer to participate in your journal is because of my friend Sergio Larach uh, working with you, if, if, if I remember that correctly. <laughs>